Good afternoon. Uh, today we're going to discuss uh, fever, pathophysiology of fever, and all the etiological causes of uh, term dysregulation or temperature dysregulation. As uh, you remember uh, in pathophysiology, one of the most important examples of homeostasis is the regulation of body temperature. And uh, this process is called thermoregulation, which is no more than the balance between heat production and heat loss. In humans, uh, body temperature is controlled by the thermoregulatory center in the hypothalamus. It receives uh, input from two sets of thermoreceptors, one receptor in the hypothalamus that itself uh, monitors the temperature of the blood as it passes through the brain, which is, the, again, if you recall, uh, is um, defined as core temperature, and also the receptors in the skin, especially in the chest uh, uh, trunk area, that monitors external temperature. In addition, uh, there is a balance between heat production and heat loss by oxidative process which include catecholamines, thyroxine, and also increasing substrate load in metabolic pathways. Both uh, sets of information, uh, meaning uh, thermoregulatory receptors in the brain and also in the skin, are needed so uh, the body can make appropriate adjustment. The thermoregulatory center sends impulses uh, to several different effectors that adjust uh, body temperature. One third of heat product producing activity takes place in the muscle mass, increasing uh, muscular activity like exercise or shivering that uh, has consider considerable effect on heat production. Our first response to, to encounter hotter or colder conditions is voluntary. If it's too hot, we may uh, decide to take some clothes off or to move into a shade uh, environment. If it's too cold, then we can put extra clothes on or uh, turn the heating up. Uh, it is only when these responses are not enough that the thermoregulatory center uh, of the brain and the skin is stimulated. This is part of the autonomic nervous system response so the various responses are all involuntary. When we get uh, too hot, the least, uh, I'm sorry, the heat lost uh, in the center of the hypothalamus is stimulated. And when we get too cold, um, it is the heat conservation center of the hypothalamus that is stimulated. Before discussing uh, heat loss and heat uh, conservation, know that as, uh, some of the responses uh, to low temperature actually generate heat, which is called thermogenesis, while others just conserve heat. Similarly, uh, those, uh, some of the responses <coughs> for uh, too cold uh, activities actively cool the body down while others just reduce the heat production or transfer this heat to a surface. The body thus has a range of uh, responses available depending on the internal or external temperature. The exact response, uh, if it's too high or too low temperature, um, could uh, involve, uh, for example, if it's, uh, the effector tissue is the smooth, the smooth muscle, in the arterioles or the skin, um, responses to low temperature can induce muscle contraction, um, or uh, if it's an extreme uh, cold temperature, uh, the extremities can become uh, cyanotic or damaged uh, by uh, frostbite. If the response to temperature is too high, then the muscles relax, causing a vasodilation. Uh, more heat is carried uh, from the core to the surface where it is lost by convection, radiation, or conduction is uh, generally uh, low except when in water. So the skin will turn red. So this is an example uh, before um, 
discussing these uh, definitions. Another example is, um, for example, if uh, uh, the tissue effector will be the adrenal or thyroid gland, responses to low temperature uh, will create the gland to secrete adrenaline and thyroxine respectively, which increases that metabolic rate in different tissues. If it's uh, too high, the temperature, then the gland stops secreting adrenaline and thyroxine. Another example in uh, behavior-wise, if the temperature is too low, you tend to curl up, um, find a shelter, or put on more clothes, as I discussed before. If the temperature is too high, then you can stretch out, you can find a shade, you can swim, you can remove clothes, etc. If uh, it's related to uh, sweat glands, for example, uh, if the temperature is too low, then there's no sweat produc production. Uh, if the temperature is too high, then the gland secretes sweat onto the surface of the, the skin through a process of evaporation. Since water has a, la a high latent uh, heat of evaporation, it takes heat from the body. So there is uh, <clears throat> transpiration uh, occurring at these extreme temperatures. So now let's discuss the concepts of conduction and convection. Basically, conduction um, is a vasodilation. Uh, it's a transfer of heat uh, from core uh, to surface, as well as convection. Um, convection is a transfer uh, of heat uh, by the movement of air or liquid moving past the body. This explains, uh, for example, why a breeze across the skin may cool down the skin, uh, whereas trapping air inside the, inside the clothes keep the body warm. When the body is too hot, it decreases heat production and increases heat loss. One way of increasing heat loss is through peripheral vasodilation, as I explained. So dilating the blood vessels in the skin, uh, when, the, when these vessels are dilated, a large quantity of warm blood from the core of the body are carried to the skin. When the heat is lost, it may occur uh, through a process of radiation, convection, and conduction. Evaporation, as I previously explained, <coughs> of fluid from the body also causes heat loss. Although the body has no active control over insensible pers perspiration, uh, the sympathetic nervous system controls the process of sweating and can stimulate secretion up to even 4 liters of sweat per hour. So when the body is too cold, it increases heat production and decreases heat loss lost through a uh, vasoconstriction. Uh, this constriction of the vessels uh, help prevent heat loss through the process of shivering um, as well as contraction of the muscles. Uh, hormones as well uh, such as epinephrine, norepinephrine and thyroid increases the metabolic rate by stimulating the breakdown of fat. So humans also change posture, activity, clothing, shelter to adjust these fluctuations of temperature. As I explained before, the evaporation is basically sweating and uh, this is the most important mechanism of heat expenditure or loss. <clears throat> so let's go through the uh, pathophysiology of fever. Normal uh, body temperature uh, is 36.2 to 37.5 uh, uh, centigrade grade, um, or 97 to 99.9. Fever um, or an elevation of above a person's known normal daily value um, is set up at this range. The fever occurs uh, when the body uh, thermostat resets at a higher temperature 
<clears throat> it's primarily a response of an infection. So meaning that if your temperature ranges to uh, up to 38 uh, grade uh, centigrade, uh, that could be a normal daily value for you. Otherwise, when the uh, body thermostat in the hypothalamus um, <clears throat> resets at a higher temperature, uh, is fever, and this is the primary response uh, from an infectious process. Elevated temperature that is not caused by resetting of the temperature set point in the brain is called uh, hyper hyperthermia. So many patients uh, and uh, professionals, healthcare professionals, uh, use fever very loosely, uh, often meaning that they feel too warm, too cold, or sweaty, uh, or they shiver. <clears throat> but they have no actual measure uh, of their temperature. So sometimes when you interview a patient, they tell you, I had fever, and when you ask them, did you take the temperature, they say, no. How do you know you have fever? Well, because I was having uh, chills or uh, because I felt my skin warm. So it's very important for uh, them to um, objectively measure uh, this temperature. So symptoms are due mainly to the condition causing the fever, um, but although fever itself can cause a chill, sweats, and discomfort um, that makes the patient feel flushed or warm, that's the reason why they tend to say, uh, I had fever. So there's still no uh, variations, uh, more or less between uh, 0 0.5 to 1.5 uh, in the morning. Uh, this is due to the circadian rhythm, as you know. Uh, hypothalamus, as I said, regulates uh, this input of, of temperature sensitivity um, through um, target organ tissues uh, of organs, you know, viscera, uh, skin, uh, to control the temperature. <coughs> So to continue, um, during the first uh, 24 uh, hours, uh, due to the circadian rhythm, the temperature varies from lowest level in the early morning to highest in late the afternoon. Um, more or less, as I told you, uh, an average of 0 0.5 to 1.5. Uh, so this body temperature is determined by the balance between heat production uh, by the tissues particularly the liver and the muscles, and heat loss from the periphery. Normally, the, hypothalam the hypothalamic response uh, um, or the center uh, in the brain maintains this internal temperature between, as I said, 37 to more or less 38. Uh, fever results when sometimes uh, the hypothalamus uh, tends to set up uh, the point of uh, temperature, triggering vasoconstriction and shunting the blood from the periphery to decrease heat loss. So sometimes shivering, uh, which increases heat production, is induced. This process continues until the temperature of the blood bathing the hypothalamus reaches the new set point. <clears throat> so resetting the hypothalamic set point downward with antipyretic drugs initiates heat loss through sweating and vasodilation. Now convulsions, uh, seizures, uh, could occur at 41 degree and uh, there's no survival above 43. This is uh, really rare, uh, but it could happen. <clears throat> now, in addition, uh, you should know that the capacity to generate uh, fever uh, is reduced uh, in certain populations. Uh, for example, patients that are um, immunocompromised, sometimes they do not develop fever or even leukocytosis, as you know, uh, alcoholic patients, uh, elderly population, or the pediatric uh, population as well. <clears throat> they could uh, have an infectious process and sometimes they do not develop fever. 
Now, um, in addition, uh, going back to uh, pathophysiology, <clears throat> there are substances that cause fever, which are called pyrogen. There are exogenous pyrogenes, which has the micro, um, you know, microbes, um, and also their products of endotoxin and exotoxin. Um, the best uh, that has been studied uh, is the Staphylococci aureus toxin that causes toxic shock syndrome. Uh, fever is also the result of exogenous pyrogen. Um, if you recall the inflammatory cascade, uh, interleukin, uh, tumor necrosis factor, and uh, many cytokines that are released in the inflammatory cascade, including prostaglandin, uh, appears to play a critical role in the pathophysiology of fever as well. In addition, there are receptors uh, besides the one located at the level of the hypothalamus. Uh, there's also um, receptors uh, located in the skin, in the spinal cord, that uh, regulates uh, vasodilation and vasoconstriction as well. <clears throat> so, this is the explanation uh, in an schematic uh, representation of uh, fever. So you have voluntary responses and involuntary responses um, regulated by the hypothalamus and having receptors at this level as well as receptors in the skin and receptors at every single um, organ, uh, which the most prevalent is the skeletal muscle producing movement and shivering <coughs> at the level of the capillaries and arterioles and skin producing constriction or vasodilation, uh, the level of the sweat glands producing sweating, perspiration, at the level of the adrenal gland uh, releasing adrenaline for vasoconstriction and uh, targeting uh, the thyroid gland um, to increase the metabolic rate. This is again uh, another uh, representation of uh, pathophysiology of fever. Uh, so basically, uh, there is an infectious process releasing toxin and the toxin and exotoxins, and also mediators of an inflammatory response. Uh, you know that macrophages and monocytes uh, and endothelial cells are released um, for phagocytosis. Uh, the inflammatory cascade release interleukin to monocrosis factors interferon and prostaglandin <coughs> that will uh, trigger um, a hypothalamic response, releasing more prostaglandin and um, the uh, release of uh, AMP will elevate the thermoregulatory set point and by heat conservation or heat production, uh, fever or the temperature will be regulated. So what is fever? It's basically an elevation of body temperature above the normal daily physiologic variation as discussed. Um, so the body temperature when it's created at 100 Fahrenheit or 37.8 orally or 100.8 to 38.2 uh, centigrade rectally is called fever. Again, um, remember that fever uh, is uh, mandated or regulated by uh, increased heat production or decreased heat expenditure, um, either because there is insufficient sweating or by vasoconstriction. Increased uh, heat production, again, to refresh, uh, will cause an elevation of catecholamines or thyroxine to elevate the metabolic rate <clears throat> or produce an inappropriate shivering or abnormal muscle activity. Pyrogen, with, we already mentioned them, uh, they're exogenous and endogenous pyrogens. Classification of fever and consequences of fever. Uh, although many patients worry that fever itself can cause harm, the modest uh, transient core temperature elevation of 38 to 40 caused by most acute illnesses are well tolerated by healthy adults. However, uh, extreme temperature elevation of 41 uh, may be damaging. Such elevation is more typical or severe environmental hyperthermia, um, 
caused by, for example, um, illicit drugs such as cocaine, uh, anesthetic, um, antipsychotic drugs, <clears throat> and uh, more that we'll mention in this PowerPoint. So at this temperature, protein is the, um, going through denaturalization, um, inflammatory cytokines are activated, um, all these cytokines are released, as mentioned, there is cellular dysfunction leading to malfunction and ultimately a failure of most organs. Coagulation cascade is also activated leading to uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation um, by fever. So intermittent uh, fever is a spiking fever. Um, so it's intermittent elevation of temperature with regular return to normal. And the most common cause of intermittent fever is infection. <clears throat> and even more uh, infection within closed spaces such as abscesses. Remittent or fluctuating fever is continuous type of fever. Um, drop in fever without returning to normal and examples of diseases that can cause this could be uh, either brucellosis or um, bacteremia, uh, infected um, graft or lines or even uh, phlebitis. Unremittent or continuous fever is an unchanging high fever and uh, this most likely is related to CNS injury or it could also be caused by infectious processes such as pneumonia or typhoid. So hydration, um, muscle activity, uh, sleep and medications also could alter uh, febrile response. So if patients are dehydrated, they could have continuous fever. If the patients have uh, increased muscle activity such as in rhabdomyolysis, for example, seizures can cause this disorder as well. <clears throat> so now, um, when the fever goes higher than 45, I'm sorry, 41.5 uh, to 106.7, it's called hyperpyrexia. Hyperthermia is unchanged normothermic settings, uh, most likely produced by heat stroke, but there's also malignant hyperthermia that <coughs> is, called, uh, is caused by anesthesia that we'll discuss today. There's drug-induced hyperthermia, and we'll talk about the most common uh, etiologies uh, for this or drugs related to this and uh, also as I mentioned <coughs> um, malignant hyperthermia which include uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome and uh, serotonin syndrome So, um, to talk about uh, drug-induced fever um, is basically a symptom of an uh, adverse drug reaction. Uh, when you administer a drug, um, basically the drug may interfere with heat dissipation and increases the metabolic uh, rate. Uh, triggers uh, for drug-induced fever, for example, uh, chemotherapy. Um, patients that are on certain antibiotics such as sulfa drugs, uh, patients that are taking any anticonvulsant uh, such as for example Tegretol, um, in addition any withdrawal to uh, heroin or cocaine and cocaine itself could produce it. Um, <clears throat> malignant hyperthermia um, if you recall back um, in pathophysiology, this is a life-threatening condition that is uh, triggered by exposure of general anesthesia, most likely volatile anesthetic agents and uh, or any type of neuromuscular blocking agents such as sulcinylcholine. Um, patients that are susceptible, uh, they basically would have an oxidative uh, metabolism in the skeletal muscle. Uh, that overwhelms the capacity of uh, oxygen supply and demand. Um, patients uh, basically uh, 
will present with uh, typical uh, symptoms of hypercatabolic state with uh, high temperatures, uh, tachycardia, tachypnea, uh, increased uh, CO2 production with uh, respiratory acidosis, even though uh, initially they would present with respiratory alkalosis due to the tachypnea. Um, they would have a mixed uh, acidosis, they would have uh, clonus, uh, rigid muscles, um, <clears throat> up to uh, possible uh, rhabdomyolysis as well and all the complications related to that. Um, the most common anesthetic agent is halothane um, but also could be produced by ketamine, by any type of barbiturates, uh, by benzodiazepines, even um, non-depolarizing muscle um, agents such as uh, pancuronian um, that we used uh, to paralyze the patients. Again, most likely these patients tend to have a predisposition or a genetic disorder on chromosome 19 and that's the reason why they have <coughs> this type of condition. If you remember, uh, the current treatment of choice is uh, dantrolene. Now going back to this cost, uh, other causes of uh, fever, uh, let's refresh uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome and serotonin syndrome. <clears throat> neuroleptic uh, malignant syndrome is basically a life-threatening neurological disorder that occurs when you administer uh, neuroleptics or antipsychotics to patient. Uh, what happens is that the patients will present with fever uh, also muscle rigidity, including um, seizures, uh, clonus, um, cognitive changes such as delirium. Um, CK and CKMB will be elevated due to this uh, elevation of uh, muscle activity. <clears throat> In addition, they would have uh, unstable blood pressure, um, They would manifest uh, uh, sometimes uh, <clears throat> similar to patients uh, with Parkinson's disease and of course more advanced. Um, they uh, present with hypertensive crisis, metabolic acidosis, um, confusion, um, diaphoresis, diaphoresis, and the temperature could go up to 100.4 or more. Um, causes uh, could include a halt all, but in addition, uh, when you give patients uh, Risperdal, uh, Clozapine, um, or other dopaminergic drugs such as Levodopa, Carbidopa, um, in addition, anti-emetics anti uh, that we give regularly in um, <clears throat> hospital environments such as Metoclopramide, which is Reglin. Lithium can induce that. Um, risk factors, uh, basically, uh, again, patients is uh, tend to be genetically predisposed uh, to to have these conditions. Um, treatment wise, uh, first is to uh, discontinue uh, the um, etiological agent that is producing neuroleptic palinic syndrome. Uh, you could give the patient dantrolene um, to reduce muscle rigidity. And uh, even more recently, uh, inhibit the dopamine pathway with uh, bromocrypting or amantadine. Another one that is also very similar in symptoms but is produced by uh, SSRIs <coughs> is serotonin uh, syndrome. And this uh, is patients also present with elevated uh, uh, body temperature. Um, hypertension, increased reflexes, so hyperreflexia, agitation, delirium, um, diarrhea, um, extensive muscle breakdown, uh, dilated pupils, um, also with clonals and uh, even up to seizures. Um, medications that tends, tend to induce this are um, SSRIs, um, in addition MAO inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, um, 
but other uh, medications can also uh, induce this. <clears throat> For example, opioids uh, can do it uh, with hydrocodone or oxycodone, uh, tramadol, um, in addition, other um, hallucinogenic uh, medications such as amphetamine, uh, cocaine, uh, the triptans uh, for migraine can do it, uh, Sanjor uh, word um, as a herb can do this as well, and uh, others that we have mentioned already, uh, for example, uh, Reglan. The um, treatment for um, serotonin syndrome is basically to give a serotonin antagonist, and of course, first um, remove the drug that is producing this and uh, give serotonin antagonists such as cyprohectadine. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, there are many uh, populations that uh, could have alterations in body temperature and that is related to infants. Uh, they tend to have a high temperature ranging as high as 40.6 and also old uh, um, aged uh, patients that uh, they do have a diminished uh, response. In addition, immunocompromised patients, uh, if you're taking uh, a medication um, that decreases prostaglandin or inhibits prostaglandin or alters the uh, inflammatory response such as NSAIDs, steroids, patients could also present uh, without fever. Trauma, um, when fever is present in trauma, is uh, really uh, a bad prognostic uh, sign uh, because uh, we have to think about uh, alteration or trauma to the hypothalamus as well and all the thermoregulatory mechanisms that could have been affected. As I said before, uh, pay attention to patients that are immunocompromised, if they have cancer, if they're under chemotherapy, even though chemotherapy can induce fever. Uh, most likely they would present without fever because uh, there's no um, proper inflammatory response. So all the uh, endogenous and exogenous pyrogen uh, could not be released appropriately and they could have lack of fever response. The causes of fever could be infectious, which is the most common cause of fever and even fever of a non-origin most common cause is infectious process. So you always have to think about infectious process first and uh, rule them out before you think about uh, other processes such as drug-induced or neuroleptic problems or um, even uh, cancer. So infectious uh, from bacterial and viral. Uh, there's fever of unknown origin, which I said, uh, even though autoimmune disorders are more prevalent, always think about infectious process. So CNS fever, malignancy, even GI disease. Malignancy is actually at the bottom. Um, when you have ruled out completely infectious process, autoimmune diseases or even CNS disorders or drug-induced fever, then you must uh, think about malignancy and work up the patient. And there is um, um, a guideline um, uh, saying an, or a protocol saying that <clears throat> the longer the days uh, have passed uh, and patient has been hospitalized, so the longer the patient has been admitted without finding a cause of this fever of a non-origin, most likely it's benign. So ruled out malignancy even though it's at the bottom, um, even though you have to think about malignancy at the bottom, uh, when you have exhausted the possibility of infectious process and uh, you have worked up the patient for malignancy and you have not been able to find the neoplasia or the, or the tumor, uh, again, continuous uh, even though you have not find the found the cause, infectious continues to be the most prevalent cause. So continue searching for bacteremia or sepsis, pneumonias, urinary tract infection, any skin infection, 
or GI infections such as colitis, cholecystitis, cholangitis, diverticulitis, or even hepatitis. Bacterial uh, infections uh, could also be related to prosthetic devices. So if the patient has a central line, if the patient has a pacemaker, any um, road or plates, any catheter. So if, it's, you have, if the catheter is being there for a um, long period of time, think about it. Think about the possibility of having this prosthetic device uh, being the cause of uh, fever. Osteomyelitis is another cause, meningitis, encephalitis, and even spinal abscesses. Virals, hepatitis, HIV, Epstein-Barr virus, herpes virus, varicella, cytomegalovirus, and even common cold. Fungal infections, and again, this is most likely uh, prevalent in patients that are immunocompromised, such as having candidiasis, histoplasmosis, cryptococcosis, aspergillosis. Now, very important uh, where the patient lives, uh, if this is an endemic parasitic condition, have you traveled outside the country, it's important to ask the patient, because the patients can have malaria infection, which malaria uh, is basically um, caused by plasmodium, um, more endemic in Africa. So if the patient is coming from the South Africa or Southeast Asia, uh, coming from Korea, Mexico, or Central um, America, Dominican Republic, uh, so, you know, Iraq, uh, ask the patient first, are you coming, or have you traveled outside the country and where? If this is an endemic uh, country that the patient has uh, arrived from, then think about the possibility of malaria. The uh, pathophysiology, if you recall, uh, uh, is called by uh, Plasmodium falciparum or Vivex oval or malaria. Um, <clears throat> Basically, um, the cycle of uh, this uh, parasite uh, involves uh, two hosts. Um, malaria is basically uh, infected by, you know, the host is infected by a mosquito uh, that um, deposits um, the sporocytes um, in the liver. And uh, basically produces an infectious process, which the incubation period varies from 12 to 17 days, um, or even longer sometimes, uh, up to a month in some patients that are uh, well uh, immunocompetent. Uh, manifestations are uh, fever and rigor, uh, anemia headache, muscular uh, problems with fatigue and pain, uh, back pain, uh, chills, sweating, dry cough, splenomegaly, um, up to even jaundice. So the malaria coincides with releases of uh, this um, parasites from rupture uh, rebel cells. And uh, so the classic uh, symptoms start with malaise, abrupt chills and fever rising from 39 to 41 degree. Uh, patients would have uh, thready pulse, uh, septic uh, with headache. After two to six hours, the fever falls and there's a profuse sweating followed by extreme fatigue. There's a splenomegaly and hepatomegaly and even up to shock-like syndrome. Diagnosis is basically by um, rapid blood assays uh, detecting the plasmodium antigen or enzymes. Um, putting two and two together um, because the patient has to come from an endemic uh, area. You could do PCRs. Uh, treatment is basically with antimalaria drugs. There's also um, toxoplasmosis, uh, as you recall, um, 
this is basically by a cat that um, the X uh, are deposited into uh, the tissue that uh, travels to the neural and muscle tissue and uh, mostly the pregnant women are the ones that are uh, affected. This is another type of parasite that um, could affect the humans and uh, could produce uh, fever. Another disease process that can induce fever is the giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis, um, very common <coughs> and relevant uh, for uh, acute care uh, practitioners. This involves the thoracic uh, aorta, um, large arteries emerging from the aorta in the neck, and also extracranial branches of the carotid arteries. It's relatively common. Uh, it's a common form of vasculitis in the USA and Europe as well. Um, the uh, pathophysiology, um, this vasculitis uh, may be localized uh, in the temporal area or could be multifocal. Uh, the disorder tends to affect the arteries uh, of the temporal, cranial, or carotid artery system. Um, signs and symptoms are related to um, Fever, fatigue, malaise, unexplained weight loss, and sweats. Some patients are initially diagnosed as having fever, fever of a known origin, um, <clears throat> severe, uh, sometimes throbbing headache. That could be temporal, most likely, but it could um, take occipital, frontal, and diffuse. This is the most common symptom. But also, in addition, patients could complain of uh, diplopia, uh, ptosis, blur vision, uh, and even up to loss of vision, which is called amaurosis fugax. There is also intermittent claudication if uh, the compromise is uh, muscles in the extremity, even jaw claudication or, or drop. Um, patients could present with uh, neurological manifestations uh, of stroke or TIA. Diagnosis is uh, by uh, C-reactive protein and cell rate being elevated, but biopsy of the temporal artery is um, definitive. So this is suspected again in patients that are greater than 55, and if they have the following symptoms such as throbbing headache, a new symptom of Sign or sign compatible with ischemia of the artery of the neck, jaw pain uh, while chewing or dropping of the jaw, uh, temporal artery tenderness, and unexplained fever or anemia. And the treatment is with uh, corticosteroids and aspirin. Other autoimmune disorders that we have discussed in prior semesters is rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, polyarteritis nodosa, uh, Wegener's glenulomatosis, sarcoidosis, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis could be um, etiologies of fever as well. CNS disorders such as head trauma, uh, any tumor, uh, superagnor hemorrhage, seizures. Now, um, <clears throat> fever of a non origin is basically fever. Uh, or body temperature greater or equal than 38.3, which is 101 Fahrenheit, uh, even though your slice says 100.9 or greater. Um, rectally, this is uh, the most accurate uh, to say that the patient has fever of a non origin that does not result from transient or self limited illnesses. So any rapidly fatal illness or disorder with clear-cut localizing symptoms or signs or with abnormalities in common tests such as chest x-ray, urinalysis, or blood cultures. So this is not a, a, a definition of a fever that you're able to um, find uh, easily um, either by... Um, history or by diagnostic test, the cause of the fever. So fever of a non-origin is classified as classic if the fever uh, has been uh, present for th more than three weeks with no identified cause 
after three days of hospitalization or after three outpatient visits. There's a healthcare associated fever with non origin, which is fever in hospitalized patients receiving acute care and with no infection present or incubating at admission if the diagnosis remained uncertain after three days of appropriate evaluation. So basically is after you have been three days in the hospital or three days outpatient visits or more and you have not been able to find the cause and it's been more than three weeks, you have fever of a non-origin. It could also be immunodeficient patients, so if the fever is, is present in, in patients that are immunodeficient and the diagnosis, the diagnosis remains uncertain after three days. Even with ne negative cultures after 48 hours, you have fever of a non-origin. Or the patient has HIV that in is included in the immunodeficiency disorders. <clears throat> so again, duration of fever has to be for at least three weeks to say that the patient has fever of a non-origin. And there's an uncertain diagnosis after one week or after three days that the patient has been hospitalized. Examples and uh, by uh, common statistics, uh, connective tissue disorders are more prevalent, 22% in patients that are greater than 65. And this uh, could include giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis, polymyalgia rheumatica, sarcoidosis, but always think about infectious process, always first. Infection is 16, in the elderly is even greater than connective tissue disease, is 25%. Malignancy is 70% and increases, of course, in the elderly. And miscellaneous, which could be uh, drug-induced fever, for example, is 4%. If there's no diagnosis, then uh, you also have to think about factitious fever which factitious uh, or any factitious disorders is falsification or physical or psychological symptoms without any obvious external incentive. The motivation of this behavior is to assume a sick role. So fever could also be factitious. Uh, some patients can fake <clears throat> having a fever. Is, uh, is an, a stereotype uh, uh, patient um, that is called Mon Monchhausen syndrome, that they tend to uh, fake the fever uh, by injecting themselves uh, certain uh, antimicrobial I mean, agents, or uh, if you put aspirin in your uh, armpits uh, that could induce uh, fever as well. There are certain uh, ways of inducing fever, but of course the patient has to be psychiatric uh, as underlined, is have, having a psychiatric disorder as underlined. So fever of unknown origin is again very important to ask the patient, have you traveled outside the country? In the physical examination, uh, you could find a relevant signs of uh, um, specific etiology. Um, do a complete CBC, including differentials and platelets, uh, blood cultures, um, blood chemistry, liver enzymes, uh, urinalysis, chest X-ray. Remember, uh, there are infectious uh, processes that. Uh, could be related to the area that the patient is coming from. So that's important to ask the patient, have you traveled outside the country? TB, any abscesses, malaria, as we discussed, uh, amoeba or giardia uh, as common parasites, uh, endocarditis, um, sonosis, any typhoid fever, uh, neoplasm, neoplasm, such as leukemias, lymphomas, multiple myelomas, cancer of any type, can induce fever. Now, uh, there is uh, a concept of uh, neutropenic fever. Um, remember that neutropenia is defined as an absolute neutrophil count of less than 500. Um, 
or less than a thousand with uh, an anticipated decline to less than 500 within 48 hours. Uh, neutropenic fever is a single oral temperature of 38.3 or 101. Um, so staying for more than one hour in patients that have neutropenia. High risk patients, uh, <clears throat> patients uh, with certain comorbidities such as uh, uh, cancers or uh, bacter having bacterial infection uh, is the number one cause of neutropenic fever. Patients that are going through chemotherapy, patients that are have transplant, um, patients that could have a superimposed uh, fungal infection, uh, for example, having uh, disseminated candidiasis. Uh, think about it in patients that are uh, prolonged use of uh, uh, broad-spectrum antibiotic, uh, patients that have leukemia, patients that have disruption of mucosal barriers, uh, patients that have catheters, patients that have gone through uh, recent chemotherapy. In addition, uh, there's certain patients that uh, could also have fever. Um, but it's related to a rash. Uh, for example, if the patients have uh, rubella um, or rubella, uh, if the patients have uh, erythema infectiosum, uh, most commonly in pediatric patients, or exanthium subitum, uh, or drug-induced as well. Uh, peripheral eruptions associated with uh, uh, fever could be secondary syphilis, uh, pityriasis rosea, uh, hand, 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 foot, and mouth disease, Stephen Johnson disease. Um, for example, if you recall, uh, rubiola is the patient will present with macules and papules that are most commonly um, presented in the face, and then they spread uh, from head to trunk, and they do have the complete spot in the mouth. Rubella, uh, which is German mistless, uh, is having uh, pink uh, to red macules and papules that also begin in the face and they spread to the neck, um, but they do not have this couplet spot. Um, erythema infectiosum uh, begins with uh, r right red cheeks. Um, they have symmetric erythematose reticular eruption. Uh, Rosiola or exanthem subitum um, they tend to have these macros and papules surrounded by white halos, and uh, they do spread proximally in the extremities. So what I'm saying is that if your patient have a, has a rash and is, it has fever, it's related to this rash most commonly. In addition, there are uh, desquamative uh, rashes that could be produced by infectious processes as strep and staph, a scarlet fever, Kawasaki fever, toxic shock syndrome. Staph scalded skin syndrome or vesiculobulus diseases such as, uh, for example, pemphigus vulgaris, any uh, urticaria or nodular disease or purpuric such as a meningococcemia. <clears throat> now, in addition, uh, there is the rickettsia fever. Uh, remember that uh, rickettsia is uh, also called ana anaplasmosis or Q fever uh, or caused by gram-negative uh, cocobacilli. Um, what happens is that um, there is... Um, since it's an obligated cocobacilli, they, uh, there's a vascular um, damage uh, releasing uh, prostaglandin and increasing vascular permeability. There's an antidiuretic hormone that is released retaining um, water and patient being edematose that can lead to uh, pleural effusions and even uh, myocarditis, uh, pneumonitis, etc. Uh, the symptoms uh, include a sudden onset of fever with severe headache, prostration, 
and most cases also have a rash. Uh, diagnosis is the, basically uh, clinical, um, but it's confirmed by uh, immunofluorescence assay and uh, protein chain reaction. And the treatment is the tetracycline or chloramphenicol. <clears throat> so basically this uh, rickettsia penetrates the skin uh, or mucous membrane. It multiplies in the endothelial cells or small vessels producing a vasculitis. There's also regional uh, lymphadenopathy. Um, these vasculitis could uh, produce uh, from a petechial rash to a hemorrhagic rash, encephalitis, and even gangrene of the skin. Patients that are ser seriously ill with rickettsia um, or spot fever, um, they could have uh, edema uh, due to intravascular um, permeability, as I mentioned before, uh, leading to not only uh, edema, but um, circulatory collapse, hypotension, shock, oliguria, azotemia, hyponitremia, hypochloremia, and even uh, delirium. So here you could see that it's also called uh, Rocky Mountain Spot Fever, uh, producing severe headache, chills, uh, petechial rash in the wrist, ankle, palms, soles, and forearms, high fever, restlessness, muscular and joint pain, abdominal pain, and diarrhea, prostration. And remember that they do have a history of a tick bite um, that will spread the... Um, Orienta rickettsii. So diagnosis is by stain um, or skin biopsy before or within 12 hours of administering antibiotic, serology, um, immunofluorescence antibody test, um, and it has to be reported by, this, by the health department. IgM or IgG antibodies that typically appear 7 to 10 days after the onset of the illness. Treatment, as uh, prior, prior uh, said, is the tetracycline family. So first line is toxicycline, um, 100 milligrams Q12 hours, and they should be started uh, prior to the fifth day. <clears throat> so it's also called uh, Q fever. You can see the rickettsia organism um, infecting uh, various animals, the like sheep, uh, the cow. Okay, and uh, pa patients could even have a tick bite or in ingesting contaminated meat or drinking water or milk. Um, organisms could attack the respiratory tract as well as the brain. As I said, manifestations are uh, very self-limited, having initially in mild uh, cases uh, flu-like symptoms, but it could go up to uh, meningitis, pneumonia, hepatitis, and even fever, fever of a non-origin. <clears throat> Serology um, was mentioned before. Um, Now, uh, there's another disease that I want to refresh uh, your memory. It's Lyme disease. It's also a tick uh, transmitter infection caused by Spirocheta borrelia burgdorferi. Um, early symptoms include erythema migraine stretch, which may be followed by um, weeks to months later by neurologic cardiovascular or joint abnormalities. The uh, pathophysiology, uh, this uh, parasite enters uh, the skin at the site of the tick bite. So after 3 to 32 days, the organism migrate locally to the skin around the bite, spread via lymphatic to cause a regional adenopathy, then disseminates to the blood and other skin sites. Initially, an inflammatory reaction, uh, which is called erythema migrans, occur before any significant antibody response to the injection, to, I'm sorry, to the infection or by uh, serologic conversion. The, um, <clears throat> even though most likely presents with flu-like symptoms, headache, fatigue, fever, chills, sore throat, 
uh, hearing loss, paralysis, heart complications, syncope, palpitations, and dyspnea, hot swelling, painful joints, and the rash of the erythema migraine. Um, it has it goes into phases. So before going into testing, let's discuss the clinical stages. Um, stage one uh, is early localized. Uh, stage two is early disseminated. And stage three is late. <clears throat> what happens here is that um, in early localized, uh, there is an erythema migraine stretch. That's the hallmark and best clinical indicator of Lyme disease. Um, it's the first sign of the disease and occurs in 75% of patients. What appears is a red macule or papule at the site of the tick bite that usually on the proximal portion of the extremity or the trunk. So look for thighs, uh, arms, buttocks. Um, so between the 3 and the 32nd day after a tick bite, this uh, rash appears. Then it spans, often with clearing between the center and periphery resembling bull's eye. Then it comes um, early disseminated, which uh, patients uh, would have basically uh, flu-like symptoms or cardiac and neurological symptoms uh, consistent of malaise, fatigue, chills, fever, headaches, stiff neck, myalgias, arthralgias that may last for weeks. So symptoms uh, could be intermittent. Um, Myocardial abnormalities could include uh, first degree uh, winky back or third degree AB block, myopericarditis, uh, reduced EF, and even cardio cardiomegaly. Stage three is the late uh, that could occur months to years and includes Lyme arthritis and even more encephalopathy and neuropathies. Here is represented again. Uh, <clears throat> the diagnosis is by clinical evaluation, and in, ad in addition, uh, cultures of blood and, and, and body fluids such as CSF, uh, acute IgM or convalescent IgM antibody titers, two weeks apart may be helpful as well. Um, ELISA um, titers. Um, could be a uh, positive that should be confirmed by Western blood. So this is a disease process that could give you a false positive HIV test. Um, so you could also check uh, C CSF as well. The uh, treatment, there's a multiple alternative that vary with stage of the disease, but typically include amoxicillin, doxycycline, and uh, ceftriaxone. So if it's early Lyme disease, uh, you could use amoxicillin, 500 milligrams TAD for 14 to 21 days. Or you could use um, doxycycline 100 uh, milligrams POBID for 14 to 21 days or acetromycin 500 PO once uh, for seven, I'm sorry, once a day for seven to 10 days, which is less effective. Um, you could use cefuroxim uh, 500 milligrams PID. For uh, neurological uh, manifestations, uh, you could use uh, doxycycline, the same as for early disease. So if I were you, I would use doxycycline, 100 milligrams BID um, as first line for early as well as an indication for neurological manifestations. Alternatives, you could use ceftriaxone or cefotaxim. And for cardiac manifestations, you could also use doxycycline as first line uh, in addition, uh, you could use alternatives such as ceftriaxone and amoxicillin. For arthritis, also doxycycline. But again, you could use alternatives such as amoxicillin, cefuroxin, cefotraxin, and etc. So, 
<clears throat> diagnostic evaluations uh, for a fever of unknown origin. So look first for infectious process. You're going to do CBC, um, BMP, CRP, serrate, CRP, ANA, PPD. So for CBC, you're looking for leukemia lymphomas, uh, leukocytosis, you know, differentials to see neutrophils versus eosinophils. If, if it's parasite, for example, eosinophils. If it's a viral infection, you would have high elevation of monocytes and lymphocytes. If you have an infectious process related to bacteria, remember it's mostly neutrophils. Uh, BMP, um, CRP, serrate, and CRP, remember those are elevation of inflammatory markers, they don't tell you much. ANA for any um, collagen disease, BPD, tuberculosis, CT and MRI, looking for infectious process, abscesses, as well as tumors, uh, laparotomy, you could do C. diff, which is another cause, do cultures, chest x-rays, uh, LDH, uh, serum protein, electrophoresis, CT scan of the abdomen and chest, uh, rheumatoid factors, PET CT, MRI. So basically you're looking for disease process. Uh, biopsy, <clears throat> for example, in the liver or the, or the lung, if you're thinking about tuberculosis or hepatitis. Um, lymph nodes, you could biopsy the lymph nodes to evaluate for lymphoma. Uh, the temporal artery uh, for giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis, you could biopsy the pleura or the pericardium, um, you could biopsy the bone marrow. Um, empiric antimicrobial treatment um, would delay the diagnosis uh, in a cold abscesses infection. But again, I mean, you always, while you are doing your search, you must put the patient on empiric antibiotic. Some remember that, for example, sulfa increases drug fever, uh, um, aggressive immunosuppressive regimens uh, could produce a fever of a non origin. Lengthy intensive care uh, admissions could induce fever, increase multi resistant organisms as well. So the treatment is basically do your evaluation diagnostic test, search for diseases most likely concentrating in infectious process, observe the patient and start empiric antibiotic treatment after cultures. Prognosis, remember, the longer it lasts, having no source of the cause of the, of the fever of a non origin the better the prognosis. So postoperative fever, basically is fever greater than 38 or 100.4, uh, most commonly is due by inflammatory uh, stimuli and resolves spontaneously. This is again induced by inflammatory uh, cascade activation by releasing of cytokines, interleukin, tumor necrosis factors and interferon. Timing um, is tends to be immediate within hours after surgery. Acute first week after surgery, subacute one to four weeks following surgery, or delay even up to a month after surgery. Causes could be related to atelectasis, the DVT, UTI, or even surgical wound infection. So let's uh, give you an idea of the by date of the most common causes of um, fever. So if it's day one, so 24 to 48 hours of first day fever is called immediate fever and the most common cause that you have to have in mind is atelectasis. So atelectasis or pneumonitis. Atelectasis again could be caused by the closure of the alveoli by either being in bed for a long time, being on the surgical table, uh, lungs cannot expand properly or most commonly by anesthetic agents. Anesthetic agents can increase the production of secretions as water evaporates, so the phlegms will become more viscous. Uh, the anesthesia also decreases cough reflex and ciliary activity, so that mucus uh, plug could obstruct the airways, so the alveoli do not expand properly and they tend to collapse. Uh, <clears throat> Fever uh, response is due to low-grade infection as well, uh, so bacterial agents uh, tend to attack this muco mucus plug. Uh, so patients could have atelectasis uh, and pneumonitis as well. Temperature elevation within 12 hours of onset of plug formation 
uh, could go up to 38.9. So high risk group, think about uh, pneumonitis in patients that are uh, smokers, that they have COPD, um, or patients that have had oral surgery or uh, abdominal surgery. Um, remember that in sentence pedometer is very important because atelectasis can predispose to pneumonitis. So tell that if you tell that to a, to, to a patient, they will start doing the sentence pedometer. Otherwise, it's going to be another ornament for the room. So prevention in sentence pedometry. Stop smoking, uh, pulmonary mechanics, uh, um, also um, uh, bronchodilators, uh, chest phys physiotherapy, and early mobilization. Uh, you could do a lateral chest x-ray uh, or an APA view uh, to diagnose uh, either pneumonitis or uh, atelectasis. The third day of surgical fever is 48 to 72 hours, and the elevation could go up to 41. It's also acute fever. Uh, most common diseases are phlebitis by either uh, a catheter, uh, being septic, or producing phlebitis without, without infection, uh, DVTs or pulmonary embolites, uh, uh, superative thrombophlebitis. So the temperature can go up to 41.1 patient will present with tachycardia, hypotension, oliguria, prostration, leukocytosis, chills, and even up to septic shock. There's tenderness and erythema around the catheter for phlebitis, and the precipitating causes are if the patient is getting infused, any hyper or smaller, or potassium, any antibiotic, any, any caustic uh, um, uh, drug could... Uh, infect or irritate uh, that vein. Uh, the, think about also catheter sepsis and try to remove it. So if it was an aseptic, te aseptic technique uh, lacking uh, when inserting the catheter or you're infusing hypertonic solutions or there are multiple uh, infusions uh, on a patient in the ICU through the same line, uh, Remember to change the site of the uh, catheter after 72 hours. This is a, a protocol that most uh, facilities have. Uh, early sign of phlebitis is a red streak uh, following the catheter. Now, that was the, uh, after 48 hours. Now, the third and the fourth day of fever, uh, having acute fever, think about D DVT and pulmonary embolize as well. Uh, so remember that the patients would have the calf tenderness, even though hormone sign is sensitive and nonspecific. Uh, you could do Doppler ultrasound um, to uh, diagnose DVT. Uh, remember the best is prevention, early mobilization, and also uh, Lovenox or heparin, um, th a prophylactic dose. Identify the high-risk group of patients, uh, which remember the virtual triad that we have discussed. Um, and also uh, used uh, um, the SEDs. Uh, pulmonary embolism, remember that most commonly comes from um, saphenous uh, uh, popliteal vein uh, being obstructed uh, from DVT. Uh, fever uh, could be present uh, even though it's not uh, necessary, but if the, pe the patient has fever, uh, the fever doesn't appear until uh, pulmonary embolize uh, has been established. Uh, patient would have pain, uh, uh, you know, chest pain, which is most likely pleuritic in nature. Would have dyspnea or tachypnea, uh, and also low grade fever. Treatment again is prevention. Uh, but once the patient has a pulmonary embolism, if it's hemodynamically stable, then heparin, lovenox, or any other anticoagulant. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable then thrombectomy or uh, TPA. Now, ur urinary tract infection, we have covered uh, this already. Uh, it's the most common nosocomial infection in the hospital and the most common cause of delirium as well. Um, bacteria uh, is the most common cause or etiology of uh, UTI. Postoperative UTI, uh, patients will present with rigors and shields, and the temperature could go up to 40. Uh, remember, the management is best prevention. Uh, catheter um, should be 
place with aseptic technique, uh, having a closed drainage system, um, and avoid contaminations. Uh, if the patient does have UTI, uh, we have gone through the guidelines uh, of UTI. Uh, pneumonia uh, could be uh, community acquired or ventilator associated pneumonia, hospital acquired pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia. Other non infectious causes, uh, myocardial infarction, uh, any ischemic process can give you fever, pancreatitis, uh, ETOH withdrawal, or any other uh, drug withdrawal, illicit, of course. Date 5 to 8 of fever is uh, called subacute. And the most common causes are surgical infection, wound infections, abscess, cellulitis. Signs look for erythema, any foul discharge, in duration. Uh, the treatment is basically drainage and antibiotic coverage. Uh, factors responsible for this is uh, mostly uh, the patients that are uh, tend to have uh, immunocompromised disorder or lack of preventive measure. Um, uh, bloodstream infection most commonly by group uh, strep uh, or crostridium uh, is a very bad infection to have after post-surgery. So look for central venous catheter infection, um, febrile drug reactions as well could, could produce uh, five to eight days after. So look for patients that are on sulfa, any uh, beta-lactams, uh, tegretol, phenytoin, prokinamide, heparin, uh, crostridium difficile, now, um, late or delayed uh, uh, fever, which is day 30 or more, um, most commonly, again, infectious process. So look for um, anaerobic bacteria, coagulase, uh, negative staphylococci in implanted devices. So look for pacemakers, look for uh, roads and plates, um, cellulitis also, uh, even though it could be uh, subacute. Uh, viral infectious, uh, hepatitis, HIV. So here basically was statistic uh, to show you uh, first one to two day atelectasis and pneumonitis, then after that uh, phlebitis or DVTs and pulmonary embolitis, then UTIs and wound infections uh, last. So um, Remember that again, post-operative fever uh, induced most likely by anesthetic. The problem is that hypothalamus becomes inhibited by anesthetic agents and uh, temperature tends to fall uh, below the set in the hypothalamus. So once the anesthesia effect is gone uh, and the intracranial cord temperature uh, uh, should be recovered but remains decreased. So the, those receptors in the hypothalamus, they tend to sense the decreased temperature and attempt to raise the body temperature uh, to the set point. Um, often there is overcompensation with a mild febrile episode post-op. So this is the diagnosis by exclusion. Other non-surgical uh, causes, malaria, brucella, typhoid, malignant diseases, postcraniotomy, fever syndrome, blood transfusion as well, pharyngitis, otitis, adenos, adenos, adesonian crisis, drug-induced, uh, produces a hypermetabolic state, um, increases the basal metabolic rate, uh, so patients that um, burn patients are an example of that, drug-induced fever, dehydration, Malignant hyperthermia that was discussed already. A uh, thyroid storm, for example, hyperthyroidism and thyroid storm could produce fever, uh, fever of CNS origin. Uh, so let's talk about a case. This is a 28 year old female, is undergoing surgery and is anesthetized with an inhalant anesthetic, most likely alhalothane. Uh, she's also given uh, a paralytic, which is sulcinate calling. So within minutes, she develops a heart rate of 124 and body temperature is 40 degrees. So this is malignant hyperthermia. There's also hypersensitivity reactions uh, that alter thermo thermoregulatory response. Um, <clears throat> examples of those uh, could be uh, anticonvulsants and uh, hypersensitivity reactions. So these reactions are directly related to the administration of a drug. And also um, is, it depends on the pharmacologic action of the drug because you could have here serotonin syndrome, you could have neuroleptic malignant syndrome, you could have malignant hyperthermia, 
or could be related to idiosyncra idiosyncratic reactions. Uh, timing uh, tends to occur days to weeks after administration of the drug. Fever resolves 72 to 96 hours post-drug withdrawal, so the best treatment is to withdraw the drug and then treat. Examples uh, um, <clears throat> of associating symptoms, uh, patients could have a Steven Johnson syndrome or a toxic uh, epidermal uh, necrolysis that, if you recall, this disease um, are severe cutaneous hypersensitivity reactions, most likely related to sulfa drugs, antiepileptics such as tegretol, phenytoins, and also antibiotic. Macules rapidly spread and coalesce, leading to epidermal blistering, necrosis, and sloughing. Diagnosis is usually obvious by appearance of initial uh, of the lesions and clinical syndromes, and the treatment is supportive care. Uh, patients can get plasma exchange, uh, um, immunoglobulin, cyclosporin, or also uh, corticosteroidotherapy, and it's actually treated exactly the same as a burn patient. Um, so drug-induced fever, always have in mind anticonvulsants after sulfa drugs are the most common cause of drug-induced fever. So tegretol, phenytoin, phenobarbital, antimicrobials also, besides a sulfa, uh, some beta-lactams and minocycline can produce it, allopurinol, um, in patients that have renal impairment or that are in conjunction with thiazide used, uh, heparin can induce uh, fever as well. Uh, there's drug reaction with eosinophilia. Always think about uh, parasites, but in addition, patients could have a rash, lymphadenopathies, uh, atypical lymphocytosis, hepatitis, and liver and lung failure. Uh, Medications that can induce this, anticonvulsants again, allopurinol, NSAIDs, and sulfas. So sulfas are everywhere as well as anticonvulsants. Uh, thyroid hormone replacement therapy can do it. Uh, anticholinergics and sympathomimetic drugs, as we mentioned before, patients having neuroleptic malignant syndrome or malignant hyperthermia or serotonin malignant syndrome. There's another uh, <clears throat> process that we discussed in syphilis which is called Harish Hirsch Hamer reaction. This is a reaction to endotoxin like products released by um, spirochetas uh, when you uh, give a patient uh, penicillin. So it does resemble uh, an allergic reaction, but it's not. It's uh, basically uh, what happens is that um, as the um, spirochetas die, uh, there is an associated release uh, of endotoxins and lipoproteins uh, that occur rapidly, and uh, this could produce fever, chills, rigor, rash, even up to flushing and high, uh, hyperventilation and due to vasodilation. Uh, malignant uh, hyperthermia we have discussed related to uh, depolarizing agents. Uh, patients would have uh, high fever, muscle rigidity. Uh, clonus, uh, even up to uh, seizures, metabolic acidosis, and they're hemodynamically unstable. Uh, you have to give fluids to the patient and dantrolene sodium. Another case, this is a 34 with schizophrenia brought uh, to the hospital. The woman has been a patient at uh, the inpatient psychiatric facility. If you search, the uh, patient was on Haldol. Uh, the majority of the time in the hospital stayed now present with Stiffness, agitation, difficulty swallowing, talking, and even tremor, tremors. Uh, patients have high fever. <clears throat> Look at the vital signs with a heart rate of 134. Increased tone in the neck, extremities, diaphoretic and confused. Even though WBC is 19,000 CK, myoglobins are markedly elevated, so this patient has neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And uh, it's basically due by dopamine depleting agents, and the patients will have fever, muscle rigidity, and fluctuations in altered mental status. And it's treated with dantrolene and bromocryptin. Serotonin malignant syndrome, I'm sorry, serotonin uh, syndrome, uh, prior, priorly discussed as well. This is related to SSRIs, TCI, and MAO inhibitors, even though others can induce it, giving agitation, confusion, hyperthermia, hyperactivity. 
diaphoresis, tachycardia, also rigidity and clonus, and also tremors. Malignant neuroleptic malignant syndrome uh, could be related to phenothiazines, Haldol, Prozac, Glosario, Lansapine, even Reglan, as we said it before. Others can be antibiotics and cytotoxic agents. Uh, others that can alter the uh, thermal regulation could be atropine, catecholamines, and remember uh, thyroxine. Uh, drugs, uh, other causing fever due to contaminants, IV solutions, um, indirectly anticoagulants such as heparin, and even hypersensitivity reactions to sulfas and penicillins. Amphetamines, cocaine, MAO inhibitors and TCA, guanidine, methyl dopa, isoniazide, antimicrobials. And remember, diagnostic approach is based on the uh, disease process that you're thinking to rule out. Either history of autoimmune disorders, having pets, having travel outside the country recently, taking a drug, past treatments, occupation, uh, physical examination, look at the vital signs and system focus approach, Laboratory, we already have discussed it, and management according to the disease process if it's able to be find, found. Um, history uh, based on onset type medication that the patient is taking, either blood transfusion recent, uh, chest, um, look at IV sites, look at lower limbs for DVT, look at um, CVA tenderness for UTI or upper respiratory problems, assess hydration. Uh, lab work already mentioned based on the disease process that you're trying to rule out. You could do throat cultures, wound cultures, blood cultures, or cultures of the drainage or the catheter that you're um, taking out while you're thinking that is uh, catheter induced sepsis. Um, you could do typhoid or brucella test. You could do a uh, serrate, a uh, CRP. You could do also IgM and IgG related to the disease process that you're thinking about. You could do ELISA test. You could do protein chain reaction, measure antibodies. Uh, and also you have to treat the underlying disorder. Treat the fever, maintain hydration and nutrition of the patient. Thank you. And this is the end of this presentation.